You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. This network is supported by our listeners. You can become a supporting member by going to arcpodnet.com slash members and signing up. As a supporting member, you have access to high quality downloads of each show and a discount at our future online store and access to show hosts on a members only Slack team. For professional members, we'll have training shows and other special content offered throughout the year. Once again, go to arcpodnet.com slash members to support the network and get some great extras and swag in the process. That's arcpodnet.com slash members. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Podcast, episode 20. I'm Chris Webster. And I'm April Camp Whitaker. On today's show, we're going to be interviewing Neil Weintraub, Forest Service archaeologist for the Kaibab National Forest in northern Arizona. Let's dig a little deeper. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Archaeology Show. Today, we have a fabulous interview with Neil Weintraub. He is the archaeologist for the South Kaibab Zone uh, in the Kaibab National Forest, which is located in northern Arizona. So a quick background on Neil, just, you know, got to contextualize all of our interviews. Uh, <laughs> he's been working for the Forest Service since 1988 and the Kaibab specifically since the 1990s. And, you know, as a Forest Service archaeologist, he's responsible for management, interpretation and the protection of all these archaeological resources on the Kaibab, which is a really interesting area in part because of its location, which is right on the south edge of the Grand Canyon National Park. So it has a lot of archaeological resources. He's also an avid runner. So if you're ever hiking in the Flagstaff area, beware. You might run into him running down the trail. (laughs) Uh, And in 2016, he got voted Citizen of the Year by the Arizona Mm -hmm. Daily Sun for all of his volunteerism and community outreach. So we have a local celebrity today. Uh, Welcome to the show, Neil. Well, thanks, April. That's uh, quite an introduction there. You've done your homework. (laughs) You know, I I mined some internet resources and personal knowledge and uh, dragged this together. (laughs) Nice. Good to hear your voice after all these years. (laughs) Yep. So Neil and I have known each other for a while, uh, which is part of how we were able to recruit him to the show. Nice. And and I'll just I'll just interject a note there too, and we'll have a link to this in the show notes. Neil was on a show we did on the CRM Archaeology podcast a few years ago. I think we just called it Fire Archaeology, but I'll uh, I'll link to that in the notes if you want to go back and hear um, a little bit more about a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today. And you know, this show is geared a little more towards a general audience, so I want to kind of focus the discussion around that way. But the CRM Archaeology podcast is geared more towards professionals. So, if I remember right, we probably talked about um, you know cultural resources resource management, archaeology, regulations, and different things, and how it applies to fire, fire archaeology. So definitely go listen to that. Well, I thought maybe we'd just start the show now with finding out what you do as a forest archaeologist. So, you know, for a lot of our listeners, they don't really know that a lot of the Forest Service and Park Services uh, have archaeologists that help work with these resources. So could you just give us a kind of overview of what your job entails? Yeah, it's a it's a big job. Uh, the Kaibab National Forest is 1.6 million acres of federal ra- land surrounding the Grand Canyon, and uh, our job is uh, to protect and uh, manage the 10,600 archaeological sites on the on the forest, and uh, we uh, in- ensure that the forest is in compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, and that all the different types of activities that take place in the forest, uh, ensure that uh, we, we don't uh, have adverse, what are known as adverse effects on those cultural resources. So it's a very big job, but another big job is actually uh, uh, working with the public and uh, uh, getting them to appreciate and understand the history of an area. And uh, that's probably my favorite part of the, of the job. <laughs> that's great. So How did you end up in working as a forest archaeologist? What kind of led you in this specific path? Your parents. (laughs) (laughs) I get that a lot, yes. (laughs) No, it was, uh, you know, really happenstance. uh, uh, After the infamous 1985 Grinnell College Archaeological Field School took place out here in Flagstaff, Arizona, your parents really... uh, gave me a, an appreciation for the Southwest. And so uh, I, I really wanted to get back and I didn't know how to do it. Um, but uh, 
you know, and I ha had no idea what I was going to do with an anthropology degree. Um, but I had applied for an internship at the Museum of Northern Arizona, and it was a job uh, in the collections area. And so I was going to become real familiar that summer with uh, different artifacts in the area. Um, and uh, the museum took me at the last second. So the day after I graduated, I got in that Grinnell College Field School caravan and drove out. I believe you were two years old, April. <laughs> We won't go into, you know, Elephant Man or anything, but uh, no, we, uh, <laughs> I drove out and uh, your parents dropped me at the museum and uh, I was figuring I'd be there for about two months and enjoy a summer and one more summer in Flagstaff. And uh, lo and behold, I, I started getting small, small jobs, uh, working in contract archaeology uh, within the museum. Uh, those led to bigger jobs and some very exciting projects, uh, some with Northern Arizona University and others with the museum where we'd be out in the field for 10 days and incredibly beautiful places in the Southwest. And boy, I was taking hook, line and sinker and realized that people were actually paying me to do so. And uh, it, it was a couple years at the museum of doing contract work. And my friend, Laura Heacock, who has since uh, passed away, uh, she convinced me to apply for an archaeological technician job at the Coconino National Forest at the uh, end of 1987. And uh, Peter Pillis, who's still the forest archaeologist there, hired Laura and I to come over from the museum and be part of the crew. And uh, I suddenly found I had what an amazing job I had doing archaeological survey back around where I was doing field school a few years before. And uh one thing led to another and ended up on the Kaibab National Forest and still loving my job after almost 30 years. <laughs> Neil, I'm curious, uh, where are you from originally? I was originally born in New York City and uh, grew up just north of there in Scarsdale, New York. Man, because you hear that... <sighs> You hear that actually relatively frequently, I think, in archaeology. I've done hundreds of interviews, and 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 people say, well, I ended up here after college uh, and did a field school here, and I've been here ever since <laughs> because we just <laughs> we, we really like the areas we go to work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, uh, who, who would have thought that your co-host here would have ended up doing her <laughs> to get out in the Southwest? I think April may have a record for attending the most field schools of any archaeologist. That, that, that makes it sound that, like I failed them repeatedly. I, I, I'm not judging. I just said you have the record for the most field skills. Nice. I have to wonder how state. much I uh, really contributed to some of those in my year. <laughs> uh... Well, there was a lot of entertainment value as, <laughs> as uh, somebody that wouldn't go to sleep when she was told to at two years old because, you know, she had to have another story. Nice. You know, college students are excellent entertainment value. So for all those parents out there, I highly recommend you know just sending your infants on field schools. Neil, let's talk about uh, uh, being a Forest Service archaeologist real quick um, before we get into fire archaeology. You know, because I'm I'm curious. You know, in in my field and in CRM, of course, the um, people are always looking for jobs in the in those those coveted agency jobs. You know, that you can stick around in for a while. Man, it always seems like. You, I mean, we we kind of joke that you have to wait for somebody to die to get one of those jobs, but it's kind of true. You've been there for thirty years, <laughs> so um, you know what's the what's how did I guess what's with the longevity there? What makes it such a good job, such a good area that you just want to stick around? And you're not unique in that. I mean, a lot of people you find get these agency jobs, especially with Forest Service and sometimes with BLM and national parks and stuff like that, and they just want to. They just want to stay there and and absorb it and and do as much as they can. What's um what keeps you passionate about it? Yeah, well, for me, it's uh, the Kaibab's been a very special place. Uh, we've had a, a, a long continuity of uh, building relationships with all of our coworkers and and integrating archaeology into um, the Forest Service program of work, and mm -hmm. so. Um, sort of dealing with a making it part of the culture and where it's really appreciated is is something that has just really been uh, something that's kept me there I think all these years uh, 
I always feel like I'm in a position there uh, at being one of the longer uh, term employees is that I get to mentor all these new people that are coming into the agency. And it's not not archaeologists necessarily. It's, uh, you know, all the other areas, functional areas that I work with, timber, range, fire, and uh, getting all these new people to appreciate the amazing resources that we have on the Kaibab and help them uh have them help us protect those uh, special places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you must have um, you must have a lot of institutional knowledge. You know that somebody somebody coming in. I mean, eventually you will retire. You know, you'll 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 move on and 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 start just enjoying it. <laughs> but um, and somebody will come in behind you, and I mean, it almost seems like. Um, the amount of knowledge and experience you've gained over over that much time would be really difficult to pass on. Um, how how well does that go? I mean, how is there the longevity now? Uh, you know, are you guys planning on? Um, do they bring in people with the idea of of having them stick around for a while, or are these seasonal positions you're bringing in that you're mentoring? You know, how is how does that go? Yeah, well, on on the Kaibab, we've actually uh, tried to bring students along, and we do a lot of mentoring. And so, uh, you know, it, it's my hope that, um, you know, when I do uh, leave the agency in a few years is, is that uh, we will have those uh, people in place that are ready to rock and roll. And they've, they've got that understanding of the cultural history of the forest uh, that's so important to understand as you move forward. If you were to come to the Kaibab uh, from outside, you know, and, and you haven't done a lot of CRM, uh, It'd be a foreign place because there's been a, a, a long tradition standing of uh, really uh, good relationships uh, with tribes and and uh, all a lot of our other uh, colleagues, our, our permittees and ranchers uh, who have a great appreciation for cultural resources. But having mm-hmm. that that knowledge is crucial and, and being mentored to have it is uh, a, a really important role that uh, I, I feel like I've been playing the last few years, especially. So I know for a lot of people, they think of archaeology as sort of you go out, you look for sites, you dig sites, you take stuff to a museum. But it sounds like what you do with the Forest Service is a lot more than that. Um, do you do kind of a, some of the traditional archaeology? We're actually going out, you're surveying, um, you're trying to identify new cultural resources. And then also all of this additional work kind of partnering with different groups um, and doing larger kind of protection and maintenance yeah, and that's the best part of it, April, is is really all the different uh, factions of, of, of uh, the Forest Service that we get in, uh, involved with. Um, you know, it's a big part of our job right now is, is serving ahead of the Four Forest Initiative, Four Forest Restoration Initiative projects. So there's a, a big initiative to thin and burn uh, large, large areas in, in the Ponderosa pine. Luckily on the, on the Kaibab, we've had historically hundred percent surveys done of the Ponderosa pine area when we've had projects. So we've had a lot of survey done, uh, and, and we've had thousands of sites in there. So it's, it's very easy for us to go back and relocate the sites and get our reports written fairly efficiently. Uh, we have new surveys that have been finding hundreds of sites in areas that we haven't surveyed. So that's a that's a big part of the job. But um, you know, dealing with artifacts and sites is uh, just one component. The 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 most important component really is all the relationship building work that we do with our partners and even the the loggers and and uh, the the folks that are fighting fires. We're constantly working with them to help. Uh, uh, really do some of these restoration efforts so that a lot of the archaeological sites are uh, protected and in some cases enhanced for the long-term protection. Well, let's get into, you know, we've got about five minutes left in this segment, so let's get into the the main topic of this show, which is fire archaeology. First, how would you define fire archaeology for someone that doesn't know anything about forest fires or archaeology? <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, really... Uh, it's working with uh, uh, emergency fire teams uh, to help uh, protect uh, historic sites that are out on the landscape that could be adversely affected by uh, that that emergency action. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's really working with the fire teams to uh, protect history. 
Okay. So it's not only protecting, um, cause I, we deal with this actually where there's people talking about this up here in Reno right now. Cause we just had like something like over a hundred thousand acres burn in the last week or around the outskirts of Reno up in the Hills here. And, um, so it's not just protecting known and existing resources, because I know the BLM out here, they'll they'll sometimes go out into an area that's had a fire to search for new resources. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe you can tell us if that's from a, hey, all the vegetation's gone, maybe we can see some stuff now standpoint, or is it a, all the vegetation's gone and now erosion's going to be a really big factor and we don't want to lose this stuff as we start getting into another rainy season in the fall? What What's more... What's more of a factor for you guys? Is it discovering new things after a fire or is it protection of possible new things because of the effects of the fire? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Done. It, it really boils down to uh, it depends on the severity of the fire. Um, mm-hmm. In many cases, uh, when we do have fires, uh, it's the first time uh, that an area has necessarily seen a fire since the Forest Service really – started an effort to suppress all fires. Uh, and, and this is, of course, historically been one of the uh, contributing factors that we were putting out fires for, uh, you know, almost 100 years now, um, rather than allowing Mother Nature to uh, clean out the forest in, in, in many cases. Uh, you know, we the, the, the Southwest region has a, a long history of uh, fairly f- frequent fires, uh, natural fires that probably swept through areas every seven to 12 years. Um, so many of the prehistoric archaeological sites have burned over many times over. Uh, but now we have unusually high fuel loads, which, as you said earlier, Chris, uh, we do worry about uh, areas that have had high severity fire because one of the problems that we will always face after a fire is the heavy rains, which will then wash sites right away uh, if there's no vegetation and soil to hold hold back the water. And we actually saw some of the, that happen uh, 17 years ago during the pumpkin fire. Uh, the, the high intensity fire wasn't necessarily the, 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 the bad part of the fire. It was that the, uh, the soils became uh, hydrophobic. Mm-hmm. And uh, a year later, we had a four inch rainstorm on the top of Kendrick Mountain, which created nightmare erosions for... Uh, many, many resource areas. Right. Yeah, we got a, it's interesting you say that the high intensity fire and how um, I think a lot of archaeologists and and people working in the field forget that in certain areas, especially out here in the West, uh, fire has combed. I mean, if you've got a several thousand year old archaeological site, it's probably been burned hundreds of times, right? So um, when we look at things like fire cracked rock and stuff like that, it's just interesting. Something we had to we had to think about on a project in Southern California, down near the Mexican border in Imperial County. Um, we had uh, we had this area that gets seasonal rains. I mean, it's like 200 feet below sea level, but they did get rains, you know, throughout the last thousands of years. And those rains would take the very few rocks that are out there. And kind of tend to puddle them up into these little eddy current areas. Um, this is at least my theory. They would they would collect these rocks together, and then inevitably, also fires would go through occasionally and burn what little vegetation there was down there, and probably burn those rocks sometimes. And over the course of several thousand years, my guess is everything got touched by fire at least once. And now we have archaeologists down in that area that are kind of the agency people running that show saying, um, oh, everybody's missing all these fire cracked rock features that look like these round-ish piles of, you know, con- concentrations of rocks that have been affected by fire with no other associated artifacts. And I'm like, ah, uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think there's, uh, you know, you're, you're hitting on a really good point. It's one I often discuss about, you know, when we look at the surface integrity, you know, things have moved around a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, since the uh, prehistoric occupation, uh, you know, we put everything in the context that, uh, you know, it wasn't until the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 that there was any consideration at all right. to all the human activities that were taking place on the landscape. There was unmitigated logging, unmitigated grazing uh, for the, you know, first hundred years of uh, uh, European uh, immigration in the Southwest. And so, um, you know, you, you really had a great effect on most of these sites uh, in the first place. And, and yet, 
you know, 95% of these are are still eligible for the National Register. Mm -hmm. they're, they're still significant. They still have uh, lots of scientific value that, uh, you know, has uh, clearly underneath the ground. And uh, you know, fire is just one uh, one part uh, that has had an effect. But as you say, er erosion. I remember sitting on a, I was trying to relocate a site uh, on uh, a, a little hillside just north of uh, Bill Williams Mountain, and I was sitting there, and it was a rainstorm, so I was taking cover, and down the little road, there was an erosional channel, and I watched a few sherds and flakes float right on down the hillside. Well, I found my site. <laughs> it was just <laughs> up the slope, uh, but that's actually how I found it, because <laughs> I saw the, <laughs> saw the sherds and, uh, uh, and, and flakes uh, moving downstream. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, we've got a lot more questions for you, but we're going to take a break real quick and uh, we'll pick it up on the other side. Back in a second. Hey, podcast fans, check out the ARC 365 podcast at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash ARC 365. That's A-R-C-H 365 for your daily dose of archaeology. Each episode is less than 15 minutes long, and we have some great guests recording about awesome archaeology. We also try to throw in some definitions and basic archaeological information. So check out the 365 Days of Archaeology podcast only in 2017 at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash ARC 365 today. Find us also on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Music by typing ARC365 into the search. Now back to the show. All right, welcome back to the show. Um, so, Neil, just for those of us who aren't familiar with fire, uh, especially fires in the West, um, when a fire breaks out on public lands, what is the sequence of events that's sort of involved in the response to this fire? You know, how large does it have to be before um, archaeologists get called in? How are you brought in and involved and what kind of role do you get to take as the fires are burning? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, it, in many cases, uh, well, number one, it, it has to do with safety. We always look at every fire, uh, how we're going to uh, attack it, how are we going to put it out, or are we going to let it do some uh, uh, clean out the forest? Are we going to manage that fire and allow it to play its role in the ecosystem? And so those are all decisions that are made by fire managers. Um, usually, uh, you know, just to, uh, you know, if there's a, a human-caused fire, uh, the firefighters go and, and, and we have to put that out. As, as soon as we can. And so uh, depending on uh, how that's going to be uh, done, uh, the tactics, uh, if, it's, if a bulldozer is going to be sent out, usually I try to go out with the bulldozer. Uh, if it's just going to be a hand crew that's going to be putting a small line around uh, a tree that's burning, uh, then that's something that I uh, don't really worry about too much. But it's uh, the heavy equipment. When the heavy equipment gets involved, they can that's probably the greatest risk to any resource during a fire um, is the heavy equipment that goes out. And I can't always get there in time. Uh, but after a fire, the heavy equipment is used to actually do rehabilitation. And so that's where we can actually make a huge difference is going back and seeing if there's been anything affected. And then if there, it has been, we can actually... Uh, prevent any more damage from occurring by locating that, uh, that resource. Huh. So basically when a fire breaks out, the fire crews sort of assess it, decide whether it's a natural, like how they decide a couple of different factors, you know, how close is it to where people are living, um, urban population centers, how high a risk is it for this fire to kind of break out of control and do some serious damage. And based on those responses, they decide, all right, we're just going to send a small crew out to manage this, or we're going to kind of deploy all of our forces and get this really under control. Um, and then based on that, you guys kind of do your own assessment too and say, okay, we know there are resources here that are potentially at risk. We know the heavy machinery is going out. And then you sort of decide what, how you're going to leverage your own manpower and respond to this. Is that basically? Yeah, you, you got it, April. Uh, you've been talking to me for a lot of years and, and uh, <laughs> you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, it's, it's all about resources at risk and, uh, and safety. Um, you know, uh, we, a lot of decisions are made, uh, especially if there's a lightning strike, uh, 
you know, if if uh, the conditions are too dangerous or the slopes are too steep, we have opportunities just to pull back and let the fire do what it's going to do and fight it from below um, or above uh, with with aerial attacking. Because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that all the firefighters that are working on that uh, event go home safe. Definitely. So living in urban areas like Flagstaff or Phoenix, where you have population centers that are really starting to expand closer and closer and further into or close to forest lands and into sort of these less inhabited, less dense urban populations, do you kind of see increasing challenges for these fires because we, you know, this sort of urban wilderness interface that's developing? Oh yeah, that that's a, a huge uh, challenge uh, uh, for the for the Forest Service, and uh, you know not everybody. We we, we see uh, uh, thinning trees as a good thing. Not everybody looks at it that way, and uh, people will buy property ad- adjacent to national forest, and by golly, they want to have trees around their house. Never mind <laughs> that those trees are p- very potentially going to burn lead to a fire that could burn down their private property um but those are uh, values that uh certainly come into play when uh we we have to do some kind of treatment some kind of thinning treatment interesting so one of the things so you guys are partly working to thin out forests kind of in advance of these fires and when you're doing that you're also sending out crews to prep them do you I'm assuming you have sort of these master maps that have, you know, all of the different resources located on a place like the Kaibab. Um, so when a fire bro- breaks out, are you kind of looking at those maps, figuring out what resources might be in danger, and then also consulting with other people in the office, you know, the natural resources people to kind of figure out what of their resources are in danger and doing kind of these large coordinated efforts? Yeah, so that's the most exciting part of uh, when when there is an incident. Uh, we're all called together in the, what's kind of an in, in, interdisciplinary team, and uh, there's a, a process called the WUFDIS, uh, the Wildland Fire uh, Decision Support System. And that's integrating all the different values at risk, and there's basically a risk ass- assessment that is done uh, in which management decisions are made uh, with the uh, tactics of fighting that fire or managing Hmm. So it sounds like there's a whole bunch of different moving pieces involved in this. How do you become an archaeologist who works with fires and does sort of fire archaeologists? What are the steps? You know, obviously you didn't start out going to school thinking, I'm going to grow up and become a a fire archaeologist. So how did you end up in this role? Well, I was mentored. Um, The Kaibab actually was one of the first forests to actually send an archaeologist, our uh, Assistant Forest Archaeologist at the time, Larry Lesko, uh, there was a fire in an area just east of Grand Canyon National Park that was loaded with uh, Puebloan uh, ruins. And uh, uh, the district ranger at the time knew that concern. And when there was a bulldozer headed out into this area called the Upper Basin, uh, Larry and uh, a few others uh, went out and surveyed ahead of the bulldozer to kind of take the bulldozer around those Pueblos. And mm-hmm. what that actually does is it allows us, it prevents us from having to do lengthy damage assessments um, and, and, and keeping those uh, archeological sites uh, from really being t- affected by uh, the, the greatest uh, threat, which is uh, the dozer putting a, a line right through a thousand year old village. Hmm. So, <laughs> Now that this is a more established field, Neil, um, versus when we're just kind of figuring it out, it sounds like when you were getting into it, um, are there programs, uh, college programs that have maybe an emphasis on this side, this sort of archaeology that people could attend? No, we've actually, I want to, let me get back to April's question. Um, uh, so there are, when you go to work in the Forest Service, one of the first uh, uh, classes that I was told to take was actually S-130, S-190. It's a basic firefighting course. And so Mm. I actually 
had to go through the training that every firefighter goes through uh, to become a, a firefighter uh, at the firefighter two level. And so uh, in many cases, uh, when I go out on a fire, I'm actually trained to help put it out and dig line around uh, spot fires, which I've done many, many times in my career. Hmm. Um, we have to actually get line tested. Uh, so uh, those of us that are uh, go out as uh, uh, red card, what are called red carded uh, line qualified archaeologists, we've taken the heavy duty pack test, which means mm -hmm. we have to carry here at altitude. We're given an extra minute. So we've got to carry a 45 pound pack uh, over the course of three miles in 46 minutes. Wow. And uh, it's it's a pretty good physical test of whether you can be out on the line or not. And so um, there's a pretty rigorous, uh, uh, you know, program that you go through. You have to be physically fit. Um, we have been, uh, my forest archaeologist, Margaret Hangen, has, uh, along with an archaeologist uh, uh, on, the, on the Lassen National Forest, the forest archaeologist, uh, Lynn Gassaway, mm -hmm. uh, the two of them have started a fire archaeology cohort. Uh, which has, I think, almost 150 uh, members. And so that's a, a monthly conference call where we're sharing information about uh, safety and uh, different issues that you encounter out on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really um, a bunch of us that have been working to train others in this field uh, as opposed to any kind of particular class that's being taught. Um, this would, you know, there's a lot of places that do cultural resource management classes, including at Reno. They have an excellent program up there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and here at Northern Arizona university, uh, but fire archeology span should absolutely be an integral component of any of those programs. And I have a feeling it's just barely touched upon these days. Well, um, let's move on a little bit, uh, so we can have time to cover all this. Uh, what are some... I guess other negative impacts of human interaction, human use and exposure to archaeology that you see on the national forest, um, besides possibly uh, fires started by people accidentally or purposely <laughs> versus just nature. Um, you know, what are some impacts in the forest that you see humans doing that you you'd just rather they didn't do? Well, we have uh, we've recently had quite a few uh, rules changed about uh, cross country travel on on. Uh, uh, federal lands. And, and so, um, you know, that's, that's always been a problem, a uh, mm -hmm. long history of people driving anywhere and camping anywhere with their motor vehicle that they want. And that has caused a tremendous amount of resource damage in the past. And, uh, uh, you know, I, that's one of the things we really, uh, want people to, uh, we, we love people recreating on the national forest, uh, but we want them to do so responsibly. And, and so that's, that's been a challenge. Um, of course, uh, you know, we don't see as much, uh, looting as we did a long time ago. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot of people that might stumble across archeological sites and figure out there's potchers and collect those artifacts. And sometimes they put them in piles. And so, uh, <laughs> You know, it's difficult when you have 10,600 sites that you're managing to uh, imagine putting a sign on every site, which potentially would invite more traffic. Uh, so it's a challenge. Uh, uh, but in some of the areas of high use, sometimes that's what we have to do to say, hey, you know, we, we want you to help preserve these places so others can enjoy them. And uh, we have a long standing uh, policy on the Kaibab. We don't collect artifacts anymore. We leave them in place. Uh, so, you know, the, we, we've always strongly felt the, you know, doing archaeology, uh, that's the beauty of federal lands and forest service lands is anybody can go out walking in the forest and, and, and get have the thrill of discovery. We want everybody to have that thrill of discovery, but we want them to leave those artifacts in place. Mm hmm. What sort of recording procedures do you guys do on these these days? Because I know with um, that that's something I've thought about quite a bit. Because we do we don't collect much here in uh, in Nevada either on on federal land, you know, BLM or Forest Service land. And you know, I think the the main reason for that is the curation problem. We just got too much of this stuff and nowhere to put it. So, um, but also 
Why why collect it when we have such good ways to collect these things? We could do photogrammetry in the field, take a series of pictures, and then produce a 3D model even later on from those photographs. So um, what kind of recording techniques are you guys using that helps you record as much about these things that you are then leaving in the field? Yeah, well, well lately we've been experimenting with um, 360-degree photography, which nice. has been really exciting because um, – you know, one of the things that it gets us away a little bit away from uh, necessarily, you know, photographing every artifact. We're we're, mm-hmm. we're more interested in the landscape uh, approach to our uh, uh, documenting our sites. And uh, one of the fascinating parts of the 360 photography is that you can bring that image back and you can actually put it into a virtual reality viewer. Uh, anybody can pick up a pretty cheap virtual reality viewer and you can actually put somebody back on that archaeological site and you can look at the vegetation. You can see all the vegetation. How many sketch maps have we all made over the years but <laughs> that, that are circles with dots on them? Uh, and you might sketch in a few trees. Uh, capturing this in 360, you capture all the vegetation mm-hmm. that's there on a particular site, especially ones that are small. And in some cases, you can actually see all the stonework as opposed to, (laughs) you know, oh, yeah, I'll sketch a few rocks in here and make it look this way. Um, You actually have not just the static image of a a photograph of, of a site, you have the whole site in your view shed there. Nice. And it's a, a remarkable way of uh, you know, documenting a site, but also it's uh, something that in the future you can really document change far better than the picture of uh, lots of trees and your lithic scatter that mm-hmm. hopefully is actually going to have uh, some major change. We often think about, well, we want to take these pictures because we want to show that we haven't uh, changed the site. Well, I kind of take a different, you know, approach to that. I, I, I believe that most of our sites should change in that we should be removing the vegetation uh, as, as often as we can uh, so we actually get those sites back closer to uh, their historic in- integrity and how they were on that landscape a 1,000 or 5,000 years ago. Well, and having that vegetation picture and kind of the whole landscape aspect for each site must be really useful too when you think about the collaborative relationships that the arch- you forest archaeologists have with, you know, the, pe- the biologists the natural resource, not you know, the water managers and things like that, because you can show them, oh, look, we have these trees. What does this mean? Are there trees that you guys are interested in? Um, really ex- helps connect the archaeology into these other disciplines in a way that I think we kind of overlook sometimes. Oh, yeah. Well, this has been a huge part. Again, this comes back to what I talked about earlier, is that we're trying as best as we can to make this an integrated approach to the restoration efforts that are going on. Restoring one piece of landscape in the past has meant avoiding the archaeology. You you, you know, the the concept of protection was stay out. Don't do anything Mm -hmm. to this archaeological site. We don't want any change. Um, Well, you end up creating these islands, uh, and those islands become cover for animals. So you're indirectly creating effects that you wouldn't necessarily think about. You're thinking you're protecting a site, but you're actually inviting. You're saying, oh, well, you know, it's not going to take the public long to figure out that all those little islands out in that high high density (laughs) area, guess what? There's something in there, um, and and people know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're not dumb. Uh, So that's that's been a a big shift in how we think about uh, managing these uh, different places. Okay, well, we're going to go to break, and uh, we'll wrap up this discussion. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just say maybe I'll put up a website on the uh, on the APN website. Because my sketch maps, I don't know about you guys, but they're frame-worthy. I should sell them because they're really good. Ah! No, just, <laughs> it's entirely not. <laughs> there's one of us that think that, Chris. <laughs> I think that, but it's entirely untrue. I'm left-handed, and they're total crap. <laughs> All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Does that make two out of three of us? I know that makes three out of three of us. Nice. <laughs> That's never happened before. Ever seen a population and three of us Southpaws? Oh man. Fact, everyone knows that Southpaws end up in archaeology. It's a documented do. fact. That is true. That is true. Okay, this is the proof. Post that, um, please post that link on uh, the website. <laughs> Indeed. Never, All right. Never well, seen that study. <laughs> All right, we'll be back in a minute. The CRM Archaeology Podcast brings together a panel of cultural resource management professionals to discuss the issues that really matter to the profession. Find out about networking strategies, job hunting, graduate programs, and much more. We'll often feature interviews with college professors, CRM business owners, and experts as well. Check out the show on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash CRM Arc Podcast. Let's get back to the show. All right, welcome back again. Uh, this is our last segment, and I wanted to bring it in by asking you all. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, kind of looting on the forest and recreational vehicles, things like that. But I know that one of the other things that you've done a lot of work with is issues with graffiti. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that as kind of an issue, because I think a lot of us when we're out hiking, especially, you know, I live in Phoenix. And so a lot of archaeological resources are in these or near really dense urban populations where you get some people who truly respect these sites and enjoy them for what they are. But then you also get other people who just either don't have an understanding or don't really care about them. Um, and so, you know, we have issues with graffiti and I think we've all seen that when we're out hiking um, as sort of that casual destruction. Mm-hmm. So yes, yeah, so if you'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing, I know it's been really interesting. Yeah, so seven years ago, we had a, a, a vandalism at uh, one of our publicly interpreted uh, heritage sites, Keyhole Sink, which is out right off of Route 66 between Flagstaff and Williams, just west of Parks. And uh, we have thousands of people. We, we opened that up because the public was visiting it quite a bit. It was uh, a very uh, well-known local attraction. And so we felt uh, we'd close off a couple of roads that were leading to it uh, back in 1992, and uh, tens of thousands of people enjoyed uh, visiting uh, the natural environment of Keyhole Sink, where there's a little uh, lava flow and a beautiful little uh, waterfall in the spring runoff, and then there's an amazing set of hundreds of petroglyphs uh, right to the le- on the left side of the waterfall, and. Uh, it's a beautiful place, and uh, uh, people had respected that for the you know, hundreds and thousands of the thousands of years that people have been visiting until uh, 2010, August of 2010, and uh, at least one or two vandals uh, used aluminum roofing cement to put their tag on top of the petroglyphs. Uh, it, it was shocking, disgusting. Um, and uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, this, is, this is a place visited by you know, 15, 20 people a day. And uh, we felt we had to take immediate action. Luckily, uh, we had a rock art conservator, conservator that was in the area working at Glen Canyon, Giannis Laubser. And uh, he ended up coming and helping us uh, uh, remove some of the graffiti, but uh, we didn't have a ton of success. There was still a, a sh- if you've ever used aluminum roofing cement, it's pretty nasty. And uh, the traditional mm-hmm. methods of removing it uh, kind of smeared it, but it got to the point where you could see the petroglyphs again. And, uh, you know, maybe we can put up a picture of that, Chris, on the yeah. on the website uh, and some articles that went along with it. For sure. Um but for several years, it just started bothering me, even though the public couldn't quite see the difference anymore and people had forgotten about the graffiti. I could see it every time I visited it. And I was uh, key tipped off to a product uh, a few years later. It got hit again in, 2000, in 2013. Uh, we think it was the same vandals. Uh, 
And so we actually uh, found a product that April knows well, now that we've done a couple projects together, uh, called Elephant Snot. And mm. it's a biodegradable cleanser um, that several cities in the West are using. In fact, Henderson, Nevada was exclusively using it because they didn't want any of the toxicity of traditional cleansers getting into the waterways there. And uh, so we actually tested it. We actually used a high school crew from Williams, our Youth Conservation Corps. And uh, it took us about 20 minutes to remove the, the graffiti that had just been put down on uh, black latex paint and the old aluminum roofing cement. Mm. And within 20 minutes, this rock art had been restored to um, almost the condition it was in uh, back in 2010. Wow. I just love this story partly because I know as archaeologists and you know anyone who works with the public, we spend so much time trying to figure out ways to kind of mediate the potential negative impacts of people. I mean, we're really hard on archaeological sites, even if we don't mean to be. Um, so it's really neat to find solutions that actually work. Yeah, and we, you know... Uh... Again, we there are no long-term studies, so this is a, a pretty good one. Uh, but after we had the success of that, we uh, have made many demonstrations to our partners, our tribal partners, and 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 the state historic preservation office, and uh, and and so, uh, boy, I've I've made a, about a half a dozen trips out to different tribal. Uh, uh, tribal groups and, and remove graffiti on tribal lands. And then April, uh, you can talk a little bit about what we did down, down on South Mountain last fall. Yeah, Neil came down and did a really interesting demonstration. Um, South Mountain has, is one of the public parks here in Phoenix, and it has a large number of really great kind of large boulders with rock art on them. And, you know, it, it's really subject to graffiti. It's open to the public. It's really hard to monitor uh, even when the park is closed, it's not gated because it's a mountain. Um, and we came out and it was amazing. Uh, the park, as part of their mitigation, had gone through earlier and painted over a lot of the graffiti in kind of sympathetic rock tones to try to at least blend it into the landscape, hide the graffiti that was occurring because they didn't know how to get it off. Um, and it was great. You could watch not only the graffiti come off, but the covering, you know, the the kind of sympathetic blending paints too and the personnel were pretty impressed at seeing rock art that they didn't even know was there anymore um kind of re-emerging from under all of the graffiti and sympathetic paints it was it was a really cool it was fun too um you know you get to hike around and bring something back that's sort of been lost to both the public and to archaeology um so it was, it was a really fun day i probably wanted to bring this up because you know i was really impressed with this product and also just seeing how this works. And I think, I know one of the things that all, a lot of us are really interested in is engaging with the public um, and finding ways to connect with them. And I think things like rock art are a really easy archaeological piece to get people engaged with. Um, so when we can make that more obvious to people, and it was, it was fun. So it's a really cool product. And if you're interested, you should definitely talk to Neil about it. That's my pitch. Uh, that, that was really, um, you know, it, it was what it took us a few hours to yeah. store dozens of of the boulders there. Uh, you know, and and uh, getting back to what you were saying, engaging the public, and and for us, we often engage our local high school youth in, in doing these types of projects, uh, whether it's cleaning graffiti or. Uh, taking historic railroad grades and, and removing fuels from them to uh, allow the public to see the historic integrity once again of those historic uh, logging railroad grades. It's archaeology, so many people are interested in it. And, and these are just one of many ways to engage the public and get them involved. So Neil, uh, you know, as we're talking about this, and and you're you're kind of bringing up the last thing I think we wanted to close the show out with in a few minutes, um, which is public outreach, and I've actually had a, a number of discussions on some other shows on the APN about, I guess my 
officially shifting view of how to uh, how to approach a public. Because, like for example, as archaeologists, nine times out of ten, the most common question we get from people that aren't archaeologists is, "What's the coolest thing you found?" And they usually mean an artifact, right? So, yeah. but that's but that's one of the biggest problems we have is people picking up and moving and displacing artifacts. Even though we talked about. There's little chance in some areas that it's actually in its primary location since it was last touched by whoever used it. But that being said, when people pick stuff up, they tend to put it in their pocket. They tend to take them and do things. And I, I know for me, de-emphasizing uh, artifacts as as really the archaeology and really making and really trying to emphasize that an artifact is just a piece of an entire story that helps us tell the entire story. So. I guess with that as the lead in, what kind of public outreach efforts do you guys have to help uh, to help the public, I guess, appreciate the history and, and, and your efforts to help them realize why they shouldn't move things off the off the forest? I mean, you're right, the, the thrill of discovery, but then put it back <laughs> where you found it. Take a picture with the high quality camera that's undoubtedly in your pocket, your smartphone, and uh, and then put it back. You know, what are what are your guys' efforts in that realm and, and how are you trying to help people realize that that's what they should do doing it 24 hours a day seven days a week <laughs> as much as we can do we have uh on the kaibab we have incredible public affairs officers that have set up social media sites and and we encourage our our visitors to go uh out in the forest and, and visit many of our historic sites uh and, and giving them that information about uh leaving leaving these places, uh, uh, leaving the artifacts alone. As you say, they are those artifacts tell an important story. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also want to connect people with those places and, and get them to appreciate what we're doing. And so uh, we probably do about 50 classroom programs a year. During the summer, we have a lot of different uh, programs. We have interns that we work with, and, and, and they help us. Uh, we try to do a, a lot of interpretive hikes. Archaeology Month, uh, we lead hikes to Keyhole Sank. Uh, and every year, the Kaibab has, ever since 1991, we've been involved with the Passport and Time program, where we take uh, members of the public and we put them on a work project with us. And we do uh, some, uh, sometimes we do research. Uh, other times we're doing some kind of site stabilization project. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it, it goes on from there. Uh, but it's, a, it, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest part of what we do. Even when we're doing our National Historic Preservation Act compliance work, um, that's, it's all about working with our uh, colleagues in the forest and getting them to understand and spread the word about uh, protecting these special places and, and leaving them for others to discover. Yeah, I've been growing more and more um, interested in the idea of presenting an archaeological site as uh, kind of as a crime scene, um, and that not to not, not to disparage the site at all, but in the same way that we look at we look at crime scenes on like crime TV shows and things like that. Law and Order is obviously a big example that comes to mind. Um, you know, we presented this on another show where. Uh, you know, like like take law and order as an example. If if one piece of evidence is is destroyed or damaged by you know the suspects or the police or anything like that, it's instantly thrown out in the last half of the show, and then they have to figure out another way. Um, the lawyers do to to prosecute or you know defend or do whatever they're going to do. And I feel like as we you know talk to the public, that that seems to be a really great way because they understand what that means. That hey, if you take this one projectile point or this one artifact off of this site. We now have to throw that out, and, and we, you know, well, you can hand it to us later on. But if we don't actually know where this came from and what context it was in, then it's useless to us. You know, we can speculate, we can maybe add to it, but it's useless to us as far as telling the entire story. So that's I, that's one of the things I've been growing more interested in trying to figure out how to do um, from a public archaeology standpoint. But um, right. yeah, well, it's you know, what we what we always say. Um, our, our resource is non-renewable. Once it's gone, yeah, it's gone. Exactly. Uh, and and who knows what role some of those artifacts or those different sites, you know, they they well could hold mysteries and and in, in, in beneath the ground uh, that that can change what we understand about history. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's one of the biggest jobs that we have is, is uh, to protect these places. There may be a time in the future when we can run some kind of uh, data collector over a, a site and it can tell us what's under there and, and <laughs> tell us that how, how things were deposited. Um, so the longer we can keep these uh, places preserved, uh, you know, the greater chance uh, we'll have, a, uh, you know, the, the, at the speed that technology is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's that that far away. So do you find that all of the outreach efforts that Kaibab is doing, it seems to be making an effort, a, kind of a difference with the public and you're getting more people engaged and kind of locally understanding the importance of your resources? Well, I, 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 I strongly believe so. Um, at least in our, you know, in our small communities, uh, I, I feel like we offer these programs, people are aware of it in Williams. Um, and, and I think that that goes, whether it's actually working on the ground, uh, it, it's hard to say. We don't see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of vandalism. We don't see a lot of, uh, uh, disturbances on, on sites. Uh, our, our worst offenders are bears. Uh, <laughs> this, this is, a uh, you know, an, another, I think Chris, and I think you, you, you've, you've touched upon it a little bit, but it's really the natural environment that mm -hmm. uh, has played a, a much heavier effect on cultural resources than, than humans have. Uh, bears uh, have a tendency to grub for uh, larvae that are underneath rocks. Many of our Coanina sites, uh, we don't see this problem on the big Pueblos, but mm -hmm. on our small one and two room Coanina sites, they like to flip up the, the, the uh, foundation rocks and roll them over. And so when we have done a little bit of testing on archaeological sites, we're always scratching our heads. Why are none of these rocks in situ? Nice. Oh, my it's God. It's so bad. And the badgers are probably even worse with their burrowing. Um, and then, you, you know, you don't want to encounter a badger. You know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the coyotes, badgers, boy, I'll tell you, it's uh, – and, and I've seen archaeologists mistake – those disturbances as human disturbances yeah. and, and uh, uh, it's it's actually the natural disturbances that are probably some of our greatest threats mm -hmm. That's interesting they're a little bit harder to create public outreach programs for and really <laughs> yeah. educate them about what they're doing that's a, that's a good point april <laughs> Still so, solid point um <laughs> Uh, you know, we're, we just got about a minute or two left, uh, Neil, but I just want to reiterate or, or get you to specifically say this because you alluded to it just now. But in your 30 years in that area, um, you know, as populations have increased and urban areas have probably started to encroach even more in, uh, in probably forest service land and things like that and activities increase, have you still like you've definitely noticed a decrease in activity, adverse activity from the public, um, whether it's looting or graffiti or things like that, uh, you know, even as these populations and things are increasing, have you, have you specifically noticed a decrease or are you guys measuring that at all officially, or is it just kind of your, your intuition that says, well, these things are down over the last 30 years and you can tie that to your public outreach efforts? Yeah, I think it's hard to, I think it's hard to tie it to the public outreach. I right, think, right. I, I think, um, you know, uh, all of us archaeologists are doing a tremendous job with the with the outreach. I think that's made a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, we in the last uh, seven years we've seen two incidents of graffiti that we had never seen before, uh, the likes of. So, um, uh, but those instances I think can be attributed to um, just a, a few bad eggs. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I think probably more people are. Uh, in the know about uh, archaeology than ever before, and considering the uh, increase in in the use of the national forest, I actually think it's pretty remarkable that uh, we haven't seen um, uh, an increase in in the amount of uh, damage from people. Mm -hmm. So it's more of an intuitive uh, uh, yeah. feel, but you know the area around Flagstaff it's it's more than doubled now since I moved here in 1986. Um, and I can still go out and recreate in the woods. Sure, there's more trash in the woods, and you know we have issues uh, with people coming up from the valley that 
that don't, uh, you know, really understand that you're supposed to pick up after yourself before you leave the national forest. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that we've certainly seen an increase in those types of activities, but as far as, uh, you know, uh, I think deliberate acts of vandalism uh, against some of these sites, I, I just haven't really seen that. Right. Other than other than the uh, discussion we've had about graffiti and and the challenges that that has posed. Okay. Well, I think on that note, um, you know, our. Our small part in this is uh, is to do these podcasts and and to get the information out so people can, you know, we, we aim this towards the general audience. So I would say if you're listening to this show, whether you're an archaeologist or not, um, you know, part of part of what you can do to help is to is to share this out. And this isn't self serving. We don't make any money off of these, <laughs> so it just gets the word out. You know, it's uh, it's totally free. So. Uh, especially on like Facebook and things like that, because if you've got friends of friends and things like that turned on, I mean the the reach for shows like this can be exponential if you share it from you know from our webpage at Archaeology Podcast Network on Facebook from our group site, then you can share that out to yours and uh, and and just hopefully other people will hear it and the next time they're out in the wilderness they can. Uh, have a deeper appreciation and maybe understanding for the things around them and uh, and leave it alone so somebody else can appreciate it as well. So thanks a lot, Neil, for coming on. And um, I know there's probably a ton more things we could talk about and we could probably have you on again uh, at some point in, your, in the near future and, and keep the conversation going. Uh, very well said there, Chris. I, I appreciate <laughs> everything you guys have been doing. Um, it, it really... Uh, this, this is a new world we live in with social media <laughs> and podcasts are just... Uh, uh, to me, the the, the top of uh, probably one of the best ways we can reach people. Indeed. Well, again, thanks a lot, Neil, and uh, stay safe out there in this fire season. We're we're getting all kinds of fires up here in Reno. I imagine it's the same down there. So, um, and and we hope uh, we hope everything goes well. Thanks a lot again. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Archaeology Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. You can provide feedback using the contact button on the right side of the website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeology. Or you can email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Please like and share the show wherever you saw it so more people can have a chance to listen and learn. Send us show suggestions and follow ArcPodNet on Twitter and Instagram. This show was produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network. Opinions are solely those of the hosts and guests of the show. However, the APN stands by their hosts. Special thanks to the band Sea Hero for letting us use their song, I Wish You'd Look. Check out their albums on Bandcamp at seahero.bandcamp.com. Check out our next episode in two weeks, and in the meantime, keep learning, keep discovering new things, and keep listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Have an awesome day. This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.